You know, as we've been going through the book of Acts, I know that I've sounded like a, you know, just resounding gong. Evangelize. Proclaim the gospel. Spread the word. I promise you I don't pick the topics, but I follow them along in Scripture, and this is what Acts is all about. In fact, if we're really honest, this is what all of Scripture is about, right? It's about God loving us so much that he did whatever was required in order to save humanity. And the cool thing about God is that he can do it single-handedly without a single person helping him, but he chooses not to. Instead, throughout all of history, he has chosen to work through ordinary human beings just like you and I. And it's amazing as we go through the text of Scripture and we see this over and over and over again. And I'll be honest with you, I've heard it from others and I kind of jump to the same conclusions too. Wow, look at the faith of Paul. Wow. Look at that bold proclamation of Peter. Wow, look at what he was able to do. Those were great, great people. The truth of the matter is they weren't. If you read through Scripture, you see their flaws are evident in Scripture as the Bible writers have depicted them honestly. And yet these ordinary, fallible people over and over again are called by God into situations in which These mountains face them, and they scale them by the grace and the power of God, and great things happen. And God can and will do the same things in our midst if we trust him and step out in faith. And I know as I've been talking about evangelism over and over again, one of the, you know, we talked last week about fears and the things that hold us back, obstacles to sharing the faith, And one of the questions I'm sure that many people have, I've had it at different points in my life, is this. How do I share the gospel effectively? How do I bring people from not knowing Jesus to a point of knowing Jesus well? You know, of all the instructions, of all the lists, right, that we see in Scripture, don't we wish it gave us a how-to guide? Don't we wish it said, this is the book of evangelism, and there you go, there's your pamphlet, there's your, in this situation, you follow this protocol, and it'll work. But that's not what happens, right? Because God calls us to step out, and the Spirit leads us as we do. But the closest that I could find in Scripture to, as a how-to to to share our faith, is by following the examples of those in it. The text that we're going to be in today is convenient for that purpose because it's as close as we could get to an evangelistic handbook. Because we get to watch Paul and we really do see his method, if you will, for sharing the gospel in the context in which we're going to see Paul in today in Athens. But I want to start out by saying this. That the gospel doesn't change. The only way a person comes to faith in Jesus is by hearing the good news and responding to it. And that good news doesn't change. That we were separated from God, dead in our sins. And because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has done all that is necessary to pay for our sins. And by committing to Jesus as our Lord, by having faith in what God has done in Jesus... We're reconciled to God. We have brought from death to life. We have hope forever. We're children of God. Amen, amen. That doesn't change. But how we express this, how we start the conversation, how we reach those who are close to us and far from Jesus, it's more than 31 flavors like Baskin Robbins has. There's there's innumerable approaches. And I just want to make sure that we understand that as we look at Paul, there's some key things I want to dial into. Some key things that, are, uh, that, that we can do as well as we share the gospel with others. But I do want to just take a moment and celebrate a couple things. Um, I have heard over the last several weeks uh, numerous stories of people in our congregation, some of you right here among us, who have started to have more gospel-centered conversations, who have invited people to church or asked to pray for people or, or, or shared their testimony, and I love that. I love that. I heard of one this morning from somebody in our congregation who down by the marina was able to meet a new couple and invited them to church, and that was such a blessing to hear. 
and we need to do more of this. Um, so many different ways to have gospel-centered conversations, to start a conversation, to build a relationship, to invite people to a place where they hear the gospel, or to share what God has done in our life, or to share the truth of the gospel, which is ultimately what we want to be able to do. But hopefully Paul will give us some direction today as we follow along. So again, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. And uh, we'll be stopping as we go through it at different points to talk about some of the things that are important for us not to miss as we go through this very important text. So Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, it says this, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, and I'm going to pause for just a second, them is uh, Timothy and Silas and others who are still in Berea, dealing with the Christians there as Paul was moving on away from persecution and the things that were going on as the Thessalonians were coming in, if you were here last week. But anyway, he's here in Athens in a new city, and he's waiting for his companions to come and join him in the mission. So again, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens... He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with idols and idolatry and, and the worship that might have taken place at Athens, let me just spend a moment uh, bringing you up to speed. So... The Greco-Roman world had a very different belief system than the Judeo-Christian world. The world that they believe and how it was governed by various gods who had a different relationship with the world is very different than what the Bible says about God, than what the, who the true God actually is and how he engages with the world. And so for the, for the Greeks, the way in which they would make sure that their nation is protected from invaders or that their crops were produced, were, 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 you know, uh, their fields were producing crops for harvest, or their, their, their wives were having children, or all the other things that they felt were important in life and for their society, they trusted in these gods. And so in order for the gods to do what needed to be done for life to, to thrive, they had to worship these idols, which were these gold, silver, or stone, or ceramic, uh, you know, representations of these various gods. And they'd worship them in different ways, through festivals, through sacrifices, through uh, offerings, through all kinds of things, in temples as grand as you can imagine. And, and this is the way the world worked. And of course, all of this was, was false idols pointing to false gods who had no claim on this world. And as Paul is sitting here in Athens, waiting for his companions to join him, he's an ambassador of the gospel. He knows the one true God. He knows the only way these Athenians are going to be saved. And it was driving him crazy. It burdened him for this people, all of these idols throughout the city-state of Athens. And so I want to just show you a cool thing here. You know, the English language is nice. Right? We could look for something and it just helps us understand everything so well. So it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city full of idols. And verse 17 starts with this word, so. And whenever we see so, it's not just telling what's about to happen. It's connecting what's about to happen with what just happened. So because of the idols, because Paul was so distressed over the spiritual state of this city, because of that, he spread the gospel. He reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. He went into the marketplace to talk to the pagans and proclaim the gospel everywhere he could because he was so distressed about the idolatry he saw everywhere. I said this in Sunday school, uh, it might not have been the answer they were looking for, but here's what I said. I said, Americans are great at one thing. And the number one answer given by people in the room was watching TV. That was probably number two. But here's number one, in my opinion, I think I'm right, complaining. It's not just you, it's not just me, it's not just Christians, it's not just non-Christians, it's everybody. I don't care who you are. You could be, you could be Christian, non-Christian, Democrat, Republican, you could be rich, poor, it doesn't matter. We're really good at complaining. 
And you know what, if I'm gonna be honest, I think that we have a lot of things that are, are we're kind of justified in complaining about, right? The world is kind of nuts right now. Our country is kind of crazy right now. There's a lot of things to bemoan. I think we're warranted in being upset and being burdened about a lot of the things that are going on in our world around us right now for which we feel like we have very little control. Those are the things that bother us. Probably similar to when Paul walks into Athens and he is just utterly distressed at what he sees all around him. The degradation of this society built on lies, which is just like the whole thing going swirly down the drain. And it bothers him so much. So what solution did he pursue? Proclaiming the gospel. You know, we often bemoan the things in our world. We complain about them. Again, a lot of it's warranted, right? But what are our solutions that we come to? We come to a lot of them, right? Uh, you know, if we could just repeal this law, if we could just get this in, 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 instated, if we, could, if we could just get this person out of office, if we could just get this person in office, if we could just change this or change that about our society, perhaps we'll fix the problem or at least make things better. But at the end of the day, all of those things have temporary and minor effect on the overall brokenness of this entire world and our society in particular. The gospel, as Paul sees so clearly, is the only solution to the problems, the systemic problems, the problems he sees all around in Athens and around the whole world. So my question is why? Why is the gospel the ultimate solution to all these other problems? And here's what Paul would say as he writes to the church at Rome. He says this in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Now, I hope you knew that already. I hope you knew that the gospel is the power of God to bring salvation. But how does that change things? Again, Paul saw very real things in Athens that needed to change. And how did he pursue it? He went to spread the gospel. Why should we think that people coming to faith in Jesus, that the gospel going forth and salvation taking place, why on earth would that fix our town? Why would that fix our nation? Why would that fix our world? Why would that be a solution to any of the human problems we see all around us? Because the Bible tells us what happens when people hear and respond to the gospel, does it not? People hear and respond, and because of that, they receive salvation. They receive right standing with God. But it's not just about their right standing with God. God does a work in them, bringing them from death to life. We call this, you know, born again, new life, regeneration. God literally does a work creating something new out of that which was old, bringing life to that which was once dead. And that's necessary for any kind of transformation to take place. And when that happens, God can continue to do work. And he does, just as he does with us. So that new life, that regeneration, leads to a lifelong journey of sanctification. Because God, by his grace, does not leave people where he found them. God brings new life through the gospel, through the truth, through Jesus' death and resurrection. And then from that new life, he starts forming us more and more into the image of his son Jesus throughout our entire lives. And this process takes place, hopefully, within the context of brothers and sisters in Christ, speaking truth, encouraging, challenging, holding accountable, and God's word speaking into their hearts and their minds. And what happens is these broken, rebellious people turn into people who honor God and try to live their lives in obedience to him, and their behavior even changes. Can you imagine what our city would look like if 75% even of the people were true Christians sold out to the Lord? Can you imagine what our nation would... Man, if our nation was 75% of people truly, not just check the box as Christian on their census form, but truly live their lives for God, can you imagine? We wouldn't have half the arguments we're having now. The world would be such a better place. The gospel is ultimately the solution to everything. 
And so that's why Paul, in response to what he saw, that he was truly burdened for, truly distressed about, that was his response. We continue reading in verse 18 as we see Paul's encounter here. Verse 18, it says this, A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, it's no wonder that these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers uh, had this response to Paul. He is speaking something that is so outside of their worldview, so outside of their schools of philosophy, which included a view of the world and the gods and how everything held together. It was so opposed to everything they ever, ever heard or believed. Of course, they'd be stymied when they hear what he's saying and have absolutely no idea what it was all about. But because he's in Athens, they're interested. Perhaps they're interested in inviting him up so that he can, uh, so they can make him look like a fool. Or maybe they were genuinely curious what on earth he's trying to advocate. But whatever happened, here's what they heard and here's what they were responding to. The gospel. The same gospel Paul's been preaching. The same gospel we are always talking about. Uh, the gospel never changed. And we see right here at the end of our of verse 18, they said this because Paul was speaking or preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. It's the same gospel. And here's what Paul says about this gospel. It's the same gospel all Christians here believe and proclaim. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 11. He's writing to the Corinthians at this point in this letter, and he's reminding them of the gospel that he personally preached when he was in Corinth. And he says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, primary importance, most important, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me, as to one abnormally born. For I'm the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether that it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you have believed. The gospel is the same, whether it's Paul, Peter, or any of the other apostles, whether it's us, it's the same gospel. There is no other gospel. This is what Paul was proclaiming at Athens. and This is what people were responding to in their various ways. In fact, Paul says here that if the, if the Corinthians believed anything other than that one gospel, their very faith is in vain. The gospel is of ultimate importance. And so we need to know the gospel. We need to be able to articulate the gospel. We need to be reminded of the gospel. It's not that one thing you hear, you respond to, you're a Christian, and you don't worry about again. Our whole lives ought to be devoted to and shaped by the gospel. We should never take for granted, never forget, never even have a hard time articulating the fact that we were far from God. We were in, immeasurably far from God. So far, we could never have made our way back to him. But because of his love, he did everything necessary, sending his own son to die on the cross in our place because of our sin and taking our full penalty on himself. He died in our place and God raised him from the dead and by committing our life to him and believing what God has done, we, have no longer, we no longer bear the consequence of our sin. We're no longer enemies of God. We're no longer in spiritual death. Instead, we're reconciled to God. We're called his children. He lives in us, is with us, 
and one day we will see him face to face. That's the good news of the gospel. And maybe you don't have to use those exact words, but that's the message. And we all need to know it. And if you don't remind yourself of the gospel each and every day, you're missing an opportunity to be thankful to God for what he has done for you. It is the ultimate gift. And it's one that is to be received and passed on. And this is what Paul was proclaiming at Athens. He proclaimed it in the synagogues and he proclaimed it in the marketplace. And he demonstrated the truth of it in a way that was relevant to his audience. We're going to see this because Paul accepts the invitation to speak at the Areopagus before the philosophers of Athens. And here's what it says, continuing on in verse 19. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we, do, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around to look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So here's some important observations about Paul's encounter here with the Athenians, with, with these, these erudite philosophers of Athens. Think about the Ivy League schools or the Ivory Tower, or these big academic societies and all the, you know, the, the people with the highest credentials, those who teach others, those who've written a hundred books in a room debating the, the finer points that are beyond yours and my scope. And this is the environment in which Paul entered into to proclaim the gospel to these people who were sold out to their various schools of philosophy, their various uh, efforts of human reason. And Paul comes and he proclaims the gospel and he does, and there's some important things that we need to observe because we can apply them in our context as well. So first, here's the first observation. Paul sees the opportunity when presented. I know, raise your hand if you would have been first to go to the Areopagus and speak to the philosophers about the gospel. Boy, I can't think of a more intimidating environment. In fact, I got to be honest. It, it, on the one hand, you've got proclaiming the gospel in a place where you might get imprisoned for it. And the other side, it's proclaiming the gospel here around who knows how many erudite philosophers who in a moment can make you feel like an idiot Man, I don't I really, you know, that's a hard choice. Neither one seems good. I would have been completely intimidated in this environment. And, and I, I don't think I'm the only one. And yet Paul, even Paul, probably had that temptation. I, can't, I can only imagine he felt at least the weight of the moment that was before him. And yet, this is where God's leading next. This is the door that opened. This is the opportunity that's before me. And he went just as he was invited. And so this is the first thing. When asked what he was proclaiming, what he believed, he didn't back down, but he took that opportunity to speak the truth to those in Athens. And friends, if I'm going to be honest, those opportunities present themselves to us all the time. Sometimes they're direct. What do you believe? 
Sometimes it's just a question somebody has where you could speak in that moment and answer. But if we're paying attention, those moments are all around us. I think sometimes we miss those moments because we're not looking for them. I think sometimes those moments are very obvious to us and perhaps we just let the moment pass because we're afraid of stepping into it. And I would encourage you that the first thing we see in Paul here that we need to mirror is this, that when the opportunity presents itself, when God opens a door, take it. Here's the second observation. Paul treated those he was dialoguing with, with respect. And it's interesting, right? These are people, first of all, this is, these are, this is the Greco-Roman people, right? The Greeks in this particular case did not have a good history with the Jewish people. You've heard me talk about Antiochus Epiphanes and, you know, at different points when we were going through some of our Old Testament books. Uh, man, the Greek kings were invaded, ruled over Israel, uh, kept them from doing worship. I mean, they, these, these people did not like the Jewish people. And here's Paul, a Jewish person, in the belly of the beast, so to speak. He's in the center of Athens talking to these people, right? He didn't particularly like them as a Jewish person. Right? They didn't particularly like him as a Jewish person. And yet, even so, he treated them with utter respect. Paul clearly did not agree with anything they believed. He thought the things that they believed were nonsense, and the way in which they were going about worshiping these false gods was nonsense. But he didn't let on to that. He was respectful, even as he was speaking the truth to them. And friends, I got to be honest, this is all Americans in general, at least from my eyes. It doesn't matter whether I'm watching the news on TV, which we know is toxic, or even looking at Facebook, which is people like you and me talking to other people. Man, we Americans do not give people any grace. We do not tolerate people who don't agree with us. That's a general rule. I'm not saying that's everybody. But man, there's not a whole lot of grace given. There's not a whole lot of I disagree with you, but let me hear what you have to say and respectfully respond. We don't see enough of that anymore in our context. And yet, Paul did that, and I'll be honest, if you want to be able to speak truth in somebody's life and for them to have half a chance of hearing and responding to it, then it doesn't matter how badly what they say or believe offends you, you have to at least show respect. We have to do that. Third, Paul presented and defended the gospel in a relevant way. And we too have to be able to not just proclaim the gospel, but demonstrate how we know it's true. And fourth, Paul called them to a decision regarding the gospel. He said, you know, in the past, God forgave such ignorance, but now he's calling all people to account. So what's changed? What's changed is that Jesus has now come. We're on the clock. The end is coming. At some point, Jesus will return. Everything that needed to be done in terms of Jesus coming has happened. And now, there's just a matter of time before God draws the curtain. And all people now are called to make a decision regarding him. And so, Paul, despite being respectful, still had to give them an opportunity to hear and to respond to the gospel. And finishing up our passage in verses 32 to 33, we read this. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, uh, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. I love this about Paul probably more than others, and it needs to, def- it needs to be part of what we proclaim the gospel to. Paul proclaimed the gospel and let the chips fall where they may. I feel like so many times in my life when I proclaimed the gospel, my whole countenance rose or fell depending on how they responded to the gospel. I felt like it was a victory if they came to faith in Jesus. I felt like it was a failure if they didn't. Paul didn't live or die by what their response to the gospel was. Paul proclaimed the gospel and allowed the chips to fall where they may. And we see some rejected the gospel. They sneered at him. Some were intrigued and wanted to know more. They weren't ready yet, but they wanted to hear more. And some received the gospel and gave their lives to Christ. In fact, Luke names two of them here. What about us? 
We need to not be so concerned with whether or not somebody receives the gospel the first time we proclaim it. And more, merely step out in obedience and proclaim the gospel. Maybe they need to hear it two or three more times before they respond. Maybe they need time to ponder it. Or maybe they will give their faith to Jesus as you proclaim the gospel. Why should we share the gospel? Paul shared the gospel because the idolatry he saw all around him in Athens bothered him. It bugged him. So my question is, what bugs you? What is your motivation for sharing the gospel? Is it somebody's lostness? Is it because somebody's sick and you know that they don't have much time to live and they don't have much time to make a decision about Jesus? Is it because somebody is just so annoying, the sins that they commit right in your presence and you wish they wouldn't do it anymore? What is it that bugs you? You know, we, it needs to be that motivation, that burden that reminds us that they need Jesus. And so we need to tell them about him. There was something broken in Paul's world there in Athens that needed to be fixed, and the gospel was the only way to fix it. And there is so much brokenness in our world. There's lostness. There's hopelessness. There's suicide and addiction rates that are through the roof. There's a disregard for the very concept of truth in our culture. There's an abandoning of the biblical morality that we enjoy, enjoyed for so long in this country. Uh, there's the decline of Western civilization. There's the rise of violence. There's human remedies in our world to problems that really just make problems worse. And we see them all the time. Uh, you know, I'm scared to turn on the news anymore because all I see is somebody advocating an approach that's going to fix a problem. And you just know it's just going to make it worse. But they do it anyway. So what's the solution? The gospel. And here's the cool thing. I don't know, uh, you know, there's, there's all these problems in the world and there's solutions. I don't know who has the solutions. But I know who has the, sol the ultimate solutions to the whole world. I know who has the gospel. We do. And so therefore we can do something with it. In fact, God calls us to. And what is the gospel that we share? That we are all far from God because of our sins. And yet God loved us enough that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again from the dead so we could be reconciled to him. And that is available to every person. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. All you have to do is believe that God did that for you and commit your life to the Lord. Certainly we could be proclaiming that to others. So how should we do it? How should we share the gospel? What are some practical things in light of what Paul models for us here in this text? First, we should share the gospel eagerly right? Making the most of every opportunity afforded to us. That's what Paul did eagerly. Yeah, I don't really feel like going up to the Areopagus. I'll talk to you here in front of this synagogue or in this marketplace, but I'm not going to go up there. No, Paul didn't say that. Sure, lead the way. And in front of all the philosophers, all the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Platonists, every other philosophical school ready to tear him apart in the middle of the city, eagerly. Let me tell you. How should we share the gospel? Respectfully. Regardless of what we think about the person, regardless of what we think about the beliefs that they hold to, regardless if we think they're just annoying that they hold the wrong belief, or even that we believe their beliefs are dangerous, regardless of what it is, we approach that person respectfully. And if we expect to gain any ground in a conversation with them, we cannot approach them any other way. How should we share the gospel? Relevantly. Paul did that. I didn't have time to go into all of those little details, but as Paul is proclaiming the gospel to them, here's what he's saying. This is what you believe about God. That's wrong. This is the truth about God. Here's what you believe about God, but the truth about God is this. In fact, your own poets, your own philosophers have said this about God. Don't you realize what they're saying? This is the truth about God. He's showing them the error of what they believe, and he's showing them the truth and defending it. And this is what we need to be able to do, too. We need to speak the truth relevantly to the people we're speaking to, and every person's different. The gospel doesn't change, but the way in which we speak it to that person needs to be catered to the person we're speaking with. Last one, how should we share the gospel? Urgently. Yeah, I learned this very morning, you know. You expect people to live a lot longer than they actually do. How many times have we been surprised by the loss of somebody? By some, something that happens that we didn't anticipate? I remember even when COVID first hit, 
you know, we were all trying to figure out what to make of it. And I had a friend of mine at, at Liberty, he was, I had maybe five classes with him where we sat right across the room joking with each other during the breaks. He's my age, my stage of life. And he died uh, early on with COVID. He went in, had multi, multi-organ failure and passed away. I'm like, whoa, this is not just somebody who, something that affects those who are older or you know, with this demographic or this health condition. It can take anybody. Nobody's life is promised tomorrow. There's no guarantee any of you even going a block or two home. Something's not going to happen. A car's not going to speed out without stopping at a stop sign and knock you into the canal. And the same is true for everybody we encounter in this town and anywhere else the Lord takes us this week. And as Paul proclaimed the truth, he didn't just say, your philosophy's garbage. This is the truth. Believe it. He said, listen, God's got a clock on this thing. He's going to judge the world justly. Time's running out. You need to make a decision. And as we proclaim the gospel, we need to give people an opportunity right there to make a decision. We need to proclaim it urgently. And what about their response? They may reject it. They may not be ready. Or they may give their life to Jesus. You don't worry. You trust God in those moments. If they reject the gospel... Friends, here's some practical advice. It'll happen. If you proclaim the gospel enough, people will reject it, right? If they reject the gospel, guess what? You continue to show respect. You continue to pray for them, even after you're done talking with them. You look for future opportunities to engage them again. Maybe don't do it an hour later, but look for opportunities to engage again. What if they just need more time? That's interesting. I'm just not ready right now. Hey, that's a valid response. This is a big decision right? Ask if you could follow up with them at a point in the future. Make that appointment then. If they had questions you couldn't answer, use that time to go look for answers. Come talk to me. Continue to pray for them and make sure you follow up. And friends, if they accept the gospel, here's the most important thing I can tell you. Please don't think that's the finish line. Your job is not over. The job is not done. Pray with them. Give them a Bible. Show them how to read it. Make a plan to meet with them regularly and show them what the Christian life is like. Model it, teach them, walk it with them. Bring them to church, introduce them to others who also will walk alongside them. Get them plugged in. Friends, I hope that we have to think through this list in the coming weeks as we proclaim the gospel. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for the examples of Paul and others that you've included in Scripture for our edification. Lord, this is not just a neat read when we need something to read. This isn't just a fun story. This isn't just history, a look back at what happened in the past. Lord, this is how you work. This is how you have worked. This is how you continue to work. And what we see these amazing events, like in the life of Paul, Those weren't exclusive to Paul, as if he's the only one who's called to that life or who could do the things that Paul did. Because Paul admits at every turn, none of it had anything to do with him. But as he stepped out in obedience, it was the power of God displayed in and through him. And Lord, you desire to do the same thing in us. May we say, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. Because, Lord, there are lost people all around us, and we hear this message every week. Lord, some of us may even be getting raw at the fact that this topic comes up over and over again. But why are we raw about it, Lord? Are we doing it? Lord, what's keeping us from doing it? And, Lord, please speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. If there is any offensive way within us, anything that's standing in the way of our obedience to you, of the mission you've called us to individually or as a church, Lord, would you remove it? And would you push us forward into your mission? Would you break our hearts for the lost? Would you show us the opportunities you are already presenting over and over again through our days? Would you give us the courage to speak the truth eagerly? And Lord, would you help us to celebrate the results together? We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.